does seem like when he shows up, people give him judgments costing him many, many millions of dollars. Judgments like no one has ever seen, many people are saying. <laughs> judgments that make, make grown men cry. Grown men with tears in their eyes. They say, yeah. sir, can you, sir. how do you get such big judgments? Hello, everyone, and welcome to George Conway Explains It All to Sarah. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and because I am not a lawyer, I have asked my good friend George Conway from the Society for the Rule of Law to explain the legal news of the day to me. But before we jump into the legal news, I first want to ask, George, you got any feelings about Nikki dropping out? Just do a little quick politics, just for me. Well, I thought she gave a very nice speech. And I didn't mind the bit at the end where she said, Donald Trump needs to earn our support. I'm, I'm okay with that because she, to the, if she realizes that she will never, that he can't meet that bar. And in fact, he immediately tweeted that um, you know, she was a loser and all, everybody who supported her was a, was, was a loser in substance. So um, if she sticks to that, he will never, ever be able to get her endorsement. That said, I don't know what, you know, what she's going to be thinking three, three weeks from now. So I, I really, I don't know. You know, I got to agree with you, though. There's a lot of people who found her speech sort of duplicitous or trying to have it both ways. But I actually thought I thought it was good. I thought her Margaret Thatcher quote, you know, as a for a person who has flip flop back and forth so much, it felt like she had finally found her footing in standing up to Trump. Right. And she was clear. She was clear on Ukraine and supporting our allies abroad and staked out some of the places where she and Trump have hard disagreements and where she is, in my mind, undeniably correct. Uh, and so I and she calling for unity. Look, I, I understand people keep people keep kind of acting like I'm Lucy with the football here. Like, obviously, she's going to endorse him. And yeah, maybe she's I mean, look, she's probably going to look for a way to endorse him. But it is possible. And this is what I want to see if you think. Is it possible that during her campaign, she realized Oh, wait, this Republican Party is no longer the one that I joined, uh, that the voters want something different. And therefore, I no longer have a future in this party. There's no 2028 run for me. And that she uses her voice now to sort of try to to push to push Trump to, to say, look, I've got a real constituency with 30 percent. They're mine and I'm going to try to wield them. Yeah, maybe. I that I have that same feeling and I'm hopeful of it, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put all my chips on that, on that square. Uh, my feeling about her dovetails with yours. Your feeling is that she finally realizes that she has no place in this party or as, as it's currently constituted. But I'll add something to that. There seemed to be, I think from the time of the New Hampshire primary on, for her kind of a, she seemed liberated. And you see that in people who finally just realize they can't straddle Trump. They can't t walk the tightrope of trying to persuade his supporters and to kowtow to him and still be true to things they believe in. And once you cross that, that line or that bridge or whatever you want to call it, it's liberating. I mean, some of us liberated, some of us didn't need liberating like you, but when I just started saying what I thought about this guy, I, I felt this immense feeling of liberation because I didn't feel, I didn't no longer had the burden of pretending anymore. And I, you know, unless she's just an amazing actress um, and she's a very, very skilled, she's obviously a very skilled politician and a very, very personable individual. I think there was some genuine, I think she genuinely enjoyed being able to say more of what she thinks, or at least what I think she thinks. Um, I, I'm, obviously, she doesn't go full bore the way I would or you would, but I don't need that. 
because uh, that's that's what we're here for. If he wants, if she just wants to say that he's, you know, he's unhinged, you're not normal, and we need normality, and that chaos follows him, and he doesn't want, she doesn't want to call him a narcissistic psychopath. That's that's fine with me. But if she wants to call him out for his deceptions and his bad behavior and his you know, and, and, and the, the sexual assault verdict, she basically referred to that at one point. If she, and she wants to call him out for, for kowtowing to Putin and all the other things she has called him out for in recent weeks, I'll take that. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't, and, and the fact that she didn't just go out and endorse him in accordance with the hand raising that she engaged in at that first debate, I, I think gives me some hope. Now that said, I mean, maybe there's some kind of a bargain, the devil's bargain that we're going to see in a few weeks. I hope not. I'd like to, I want to like Nikki Haley. I want to support Nikki Haley. Um, and the last few weeks, I, I, you know, she won me over to some extent. Uh, and we'll, we'll just have to see where, where she takes it from here. Yeah, you know, you, you, the point you're just making, though, about the freedom, like when you were the people don't realize, I think, who aren't sort of adjacent to politics and what, or, or aren't in places where it takes so much energy to calibrate. Right. It just it's like hard. It's like exhausting because you are not saying the thing that you think it is. Part of what is freeing is you're like, no, this is what I really think. So I don't have to think that hard about what I'm saying. And you could right. see how much better she got when she was being right. authentic saying the things that mattered to her. Um, and I also, you know, hope dies last. And so like you, I wouldn't bet my house on it, but I'm going to hold out hope and not just give in to the cynicism uh, that says she will absolutely turn around and endorse Trump. Um, yeah, and you and right. I are similar in, 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 one res in, in a respect that we tend, and not all the people who oppose Trump are like this, but you and I, I think, tend to project um, positive things onto people. We want to assume the best in them. I think there are a lot of people who agree with us on Trump who have just decided that everybody is, everybody is bad. Look, I'll take, I'll take a convert any day of the week. You know, if, if, if I think the conversion is real, and I think when they do, con when people do convert away from Trumpism, it is real. Because they are, you can just see the relief in their faces of the, the idea that you don't have to be carrying the burden of lies and you don't have to be calculating everything that you say and, and trying to find some kind of, 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 of ridiculous, uh, false equivalence to, to, to change the subject. I mean, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of, into, you know, to be deceptive and, and, and to, 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 to handle this guy and to, to, to try to, to, um, push away the dissonance that it requires, the dissonance that's required to support him. I mean, that's just a lot of energy. I, I don't have that kind of energy. It's, it's energy, and then I think it's also depleting because it gnaws at your soul. Um, Correct. I mean, I, I, just, I just watch, you know, Mitch McConnell. Here's another piece of news. Um, I wasn't Oof. planning on talking so much politics, but I just, I just like to say that it must be agony to have to kowtow and endorse a man who made racist statements about your wife, called you old crow, and hijacked your party, and you're the one, Mitch, you're the one who let him off the hook in the first place. You're the one who had the power to keep it from happening. You whiffed on it, you, you, you punked out, and now, now this guy's back, and your job's over, and your legacy's crushed. Absolutely, and, and the thing about it, what must hurt the most for McConnell is that he knows the truth. He spoke yeah. the truth, even though he voted the wrong way and had his caucus vote the wrong way on February 13, 2021. He made all the right points other than the legal point about whether or not the president, a, a former president could be barred from future public office for crimes that he committed or high crimes and misdemeanors he committed while in office. He said that Trump was responsible. President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. Didn't get away with anything yet. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. 
he said that Trump basically just watched TV in, in glee while the, the rioting went on at the Capitol, while the insurrection went on. And then he basically said, there's a criminal law in this country. And he basically addressed Trump's the immunity claim. He, he said he's not immune from being held criminally or civilly liable. That's how he ended his speech. And I was there like standing up. I wanted to applaud him. So he knows the truth. And there's our link to the, to the legal issues there. Um, you know, I think that somebody should take his remarks that day and file it as an amicus brief in the Supreme Court. And so, I, you know, he, he knows better. And, and given that this is the end of his career, He's 82 years old. He's clearly not physically well, and I, that's probably a driving factor in his stepping down as majority leader. Why not go out and just tell the truth for once? And and you know, I I don't I just don't get it. I I don't get it. Instead, he gives these stiff responses about as I said on February blah, 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 2021, I will support the nominee of my party, like a wooden robot. It's like, dude, you, I you can change your he mind. Said, I remember when he said that on TV. He was like gaunt and sallow and sweating. Like you could just see how much of a burden it was for him to have to say that he would uh, support whoever the nominee was, knowing at that point that it was looking more and more like it was gonna be Trump. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, George, the phrase, there are only so many hours in a day, really starts to ring true the more life goes on. And it's especially true when you're spending all your energy attempting to preserve democracy from an aspiring dictator. Can you imagine having just one extra hour in the day? If I had it, I would probably sleep more. I don't know about you, I've been getting up early to do a lot of news. Uh, but honestly, there are so many things I feel obligated to do if I had just a little bit more time each day. And that's why it's so essential to know what's important to you. And therapy can be a great way to find out what aspects of your life you should be prioritizing. George, can you think of anybody in politics who is prioritizing all the wrong things and maybe could have benefited from therapy? Well... It, I, I, there's this guy, I, I can't, I forget his name. What's his name? He's orange. He's orange. I think I know that guy. I think I've seen he that guy. He can use some tint therapy. Does this, is, does this product cover that? Uh, I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure if it does. I don't, did you see Elon uh, tweet recently that he uh, never went to therapy? And that was, uh, I was like, yeah, man, no kidding. I can tell. Uh, well, look, if any of our listeners are considering starting therapy, Give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed, to, and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash askgeorge today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash ask George. I want to do a rundown of the cases because there's like a little bit of movement in a bunch of them. Uh, yes. And so we did a pr pretty solid recap of the Trump versus Anderson opinion in the emergency episode on Monday. So if you haven't listened to that, go check it out. But I wanted to quickly one thing we didn't talk about there was this story that came out about the meta data. Uh, and it's interesting. So just to bring listeners up to speed, seemingly in a rush to get the disqualification opinion out, the document wasn't fully scrubbed for metadata. So folks were able to see that in an earlier draft, Sotomayor's concurrence was actually part concurrence and part dissent. Ultimately, this doesn't change anything and it isn't a huge deal, but it seems to me that it underscores just how hard Roberts must be working to uphold the verni the uphold the veneer of unanimity and legitimacy of the court. Uh, so what did, did you, were you surprised to see this metadata thing? It actually seems to underscore what you were saying about how things didn't seem to make sense. Did that make it make a little more sense to you that yeah. Sotomayor no, had mean, actually uh, not concurred? Mark Joseph Stern did a, a, a public service by looking at the metadata. It's something <laughs> reporters should always do. And yeah, I thought, I mean, my reading of the opinions were they didn't quite line up. And I can see how that happens. I and mean, we've actually seen it before in the Supreme Court. Um, if you've ever, 
I, I remember looking at the opinions in, I guess it was 1989, in that the abortion case, I guess it was called, it was Webster against Reproductive Health Services, if I'm not mistaken. And you could tell that Chief Justice Rehnquist's plurality opinion for four had been written in the style of a majority opinion, and that the the the, the opinions of justice, uh, uh, the opinion of Justice O'Connor seemed to be looked like it was a last minute thing, and and then there was a, a separate opinion from Justice Scalia, as I recall, that kind of that, that, that seemed to have a little in it that was. Attacking the majority and then attacking the, the it just seemed like somebody switched their votes and then later, namely Justice O'Connor, and that that's the way it looked like when you kind of parse through the opinion that she, that she I think she must have switched her vote at the very last minute of the, the couple of days before the release date in June and sure enough when when the books came out about what happened that's exactly what happened you can sometimes tell. You know, they don't have, you know, particularly when they're under time pressure, they don't do very well always in matching up the opinions. And it's not for want of legal skill. It's for the fact that you, you got nine people and, they're cha- and if they, they can change the text of an opinion at any moment. And now you're going to change everything that you've written. But it was clear to me, and that's what I said at the podcast before we knew about the metadata, that this was moving around. And I think what my theory is that the majority opinion actually had more explicit language in a draft about how a federal lawsuit would not be permitted without congressional authorization and that other federal actions, uh, by maybe even by Congress, uh, in terms of, its, uh, of the electoral vote count that occurs every four years on January 6th, maybe they couldn't disqualify a presidential candidate either. I don't know, but that seemed to be what the attack from Justice Sotomayor's concurrence, which we now know was a dissent at one point. So it may well be that some of the harsher language in that opinion, in in Sotomayor's opinion, was an artifact of even harsher language that was referring to an earlier draft opinion. And then Justice Barrett's opinion, which was essentially like a, a Rodney King um, can't we all just get along here, opinion, um, that she seemed to be saying that there's, we can't be strident here. Well, I didn't find Sotomayor's opinion all that strident um, for Sotomayor. She can be really, really tough with the pen, as as could Justice Scalia in his, his day. I thought she was relatively contained. And so my theory was she the, 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 the majority opinion went a lot farther than it actually did in foreclosing uh, non-state efforts, uh, federal efforts, whether it be by federal, the federal judiciary, federal, federal litigation to stop um, a presidential candidate from getting on the ballot. And that prompted a, a very, very strong dissent from Sotomayor. And then the majority took some of that, some or most of that language out, but there was still kind of shades of it. And so Sotomayor toned her opinion down. And then Barrett was still out there saying, can't we all just get along? And I, that's, that's how I think. I mean, if you, if, if I saw a pile of these drafts, if we ultimately got, if they were leaked, I'll, I would bet money, um, more than I would bet on, uh, Nikki Haley. Uh, not endorsing Trump, as we discussed earlier, I'd bet more that that's that's exactly how these opinions came about. Hey, what? How does it work when they're trying to like uh, come to a nine-person unanimous conclusion? Like, do they stay up all night eating Chinese food with a whiteboard? You know, you know, giving each other a hard time, horse trading lines from opinions, or did their staffs go back and forth submitting draft after draft, trying to like organize it? Like, how does it work when you? Well, because. Uh, yeah, I, no, I, I, only, I did not clerk on the Supreme Court. I did clerk on a federal court of appeals, the one in New York, which is a lot simpler most of the time because the, the courts, the courts of appeals sit in three judge panels and only occasionally sit as an entire court. Uh, my court, the court I clerked for the Second Circuit. Yeah, en banc. Very good. Very, <laughs> you're learning a lot. And, and there are 13 judges normally when, the, when they have a full complement on the Second Circuit. And so when, when you had an en banc, it could get kind of messy because 
the, obviously the person who has been assigned the majority opinion or the, the opinion that's supposed to be the opinion of the court after argument is trying to get as many votes as possible and then everybody has their little nitpicks. And so what, what happens, they don't sit in a room and do this. And, and I, I know what I know about the Supreme Court based upon, you know, no, knowing law clerks and having read books about it. They don't really sit together in the same room. Occasionally one justice may walk over to another justice's chambers for a private conversation, but usually they just send the paper around. They send drafts around. They talk to each other in drafts. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a cloistered and, and monastic existence. They don't really get together to talk other than at oral argument and then at the conference that they hold immediately uh, uh, at the end of a, of a, of an argument week where they're discussing all their cases or discussing or conferences where they're discussing what cases to take. But by, by and large, they don't really have a lot of conversations about opinions they circulate what they think should the opinion should say and then they'll circulate comments on what other people are saying and that's how i mean that's, that's kind of how lawyers operate interesting interesting all right well since the oral argument in this case we've gotten a lot of listener questions about the 22nd amendment so to remind folks the 22nd amendment says that no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice and this issue came up at oral argument when Justice Sotomayor asked Trump's lawyer, if a president runs for a third term, can a state disqualify him? A listener named Greg wrote in and asked, is this as chilling as it sounds? I honestly do not know how the court would address that issue because their entire discussion in Trump v. Anderson was directed at the nature of, of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. But that being said, um, the some of the logic, which is that different states could reach different conclusions, could apply to any number of things. I think the answer would be that whether somebody has been elected previously twice to the office of president and whether somebody is going to be 35 on January 20th of a year uh, divisible by four, that those things are not subject to reasonable dispute. And accordingly, states could make that determination because they does, it doesn't present the risk of conflicting determinations that whether or not someone engaged in an insurrection in violation of their oath, um, uh, that, that issue uh, it, it, it would be different because it, you, could, you could have reasonably differing views in, in some other case, not this one. Okay. Does that, does that make you feel better? Do people feel better by that? Uh, I don't know. Okay, moving on to the D.C. <laughs> January 6th case. The Supreme Court scheduled the oral argument on the immunity question for Thursday, April 25th, which means that the Supreme Court has at most two months to crank out an opinion before the term ends at the end of June, and hopefully they will move faster than that. April 25th is also probably a trial date in the New York election interference hush money case, so Trump's going to be busy, yes? Can he be He's just be... like do these at the same time? Yes, he can do that. He doesn't need to show up for an appellate argument. Uh, he has the right to show up for, the, for, for his criminal trial, and a judge can require it, but he doesn't have to show up for that either. Uh, that said, he, you know, he didn't go to the Supreme Court argument in the 14th Amendment case. I don't know that he will go to the argument in the immunity case, although he did go to the argument in the immunity case. I, I saw the back of his head from 25 feet behind uh, in the D.C. Circuit. So I, I don't know what he's going to do that day. I don't know that he helps himself by showing up there, uh, but he can do whatever he wants. It does seem like when he shows up, people <laughs> give him judgments costing him many, many millions of dollars. Tens True. of millions of dollars. Uh, judgments which... like no one has ever seen, many people are saying. <laughs> judgments that make make grown men cry. Amazing. Grown judgments. men with tears in their eyes. They say, yes. sir, 
Can you, sir. how do you get such big judgments? <laughs> it's you, sir. I mean, we say size does, the size doesn't matter, but with judgments, it does. Uh, I should cut that one out. <laughs> no, that was funny. Uh, Actually, okay. Which leads me to the E. Jean Carroll defamation case, right? So the yesterday, uh, they were, Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, wrote a letter to the judge asking, I don't, is it Haba? Trump's Haba. lawyer, Alina Haba, Haba wrote a letter Haba. to the judge asking, I don't even know, asking what? Uh, to buy more time and securing this $91 million bond? Is that yes. what she's trying to do, get more time? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, you know, the upshot is, as I, as I X'd or tweeted, I said, orange rapist Haba no bond. <laughs> and, and that this- seems to be the problem. I don't know whether, maybe he'll get one. Um, the 30 days after the entry of judgment, which was on February 8th, it runs on Friday, uh, no, on Saturday. And as a result, he has until Monday to post the bond uh, or, or else collection efforts can start. So we'll see. Uh, he clearly doesn't think he can get the bond by Monday. I don't know what, uh, I don't know what his plans are to pay the judgment or secure a bond by next, I guess, Thursday, if he's asking for three days. I don't remember how many days he was asking for. I don't know what he is going to be able to do in those three days that he hasn't been able to do that already, but we'll see. And then he's got the other problem of another 450 odd million dollars for the state case. I, I, he's, a, he's, an, he's in difficult circumstances. And I think, you know, it may, that may well be, I, I, I didn't watch his um, victory speech uh, on Super Tuesday, but he seemed apparently was not on his game. And maybe he was burdened by the need to obtain two supersidious bonds. I don't know. Yeah, right. He's probably got to, what, unload several buildings in like a fire sale to try to put together the Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can sell a building that quickly. I think you might That's be able true. to, maybe you could, maybe you could mortgage at a, at another mortgage at some, at some high rate to the extent that the property is unencumbered. But I, you know, I don't know. I have no but idea. Then what what happens if he just can't do it? Then E. Jean Carroll and or Tish James can go around and try to seize or attach assets or put liens on things. And which makes it, you know, which which is not good for business. And it makes it difficult, for example, to to uh, it could trigger debt covenants. Um, you know, it could, it could, it could mean that a bank could have to recall a loan. I don't know. Um, it, it just presents all sorts of complications. You, you rather not want to have some, you don't want to have somebody trying to take your stuff away while you're in it. <laughs> so, um, not good for him. You know, just on this question, uh, which is basically how Trump is going to pay, there was one of the guys at the RNC, I forget his name, but one of the delegates tried to pass a, I don't know, I don't know what it was. Henry would be, Barber, Haley's, Haley's, son, Haley, Haley, Haley's grandson or cousin or something, right? Oh, is that right? Okay, I didn't put that together, but he was definitely like, we should pass a resolution saying that they can't use campaign right. funds and to pay down. Trump's legal fees, and <laughs> they got voted down, right. which means that the RNC was affirmatively being like, yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. We can use campaign. Co- Are they really? They're going to have voters pay off this guy's fine. Well, they don't. They've only. Sarah, as I understand it, the RNC only has like $8 million now. I know. Okay. It's because Trump sucks it all up. I mean, you, you, uh, you, you, you walk down Fifth Avenue and there are people like all, all sorts of people will be walking around with, with that in their pockets there. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to pay off his judgment. Um, but hey, you know, uh, Lara, La, they, uh, he just, I think he installed Lara Trump yesterday or today. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what they come up with. I don't know people are going to write checks to the RNC anymore. They haven't I love lately. that. I love that Lara Trump is like the co-director. Like, who's the other person? Who's the other person that's like the pain sponge 
uh, and just like the the meat puppet that they say is like the person. Laura Trump is. It's like a mafia thing, right? Like ma- yeah. Laura Trump is that person. The, 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 the other person's like a real person. He's a real politico. Yeah. Who knows what he's right. doing? But she. That, you know, but who doesn't have any power? Probably because the family's in charge. No, no it's a family business now. Absolutely. Oof. That no, is. Not, that's not. It, it could. I mean, there's so many things that are afflicting the Republican Party. As you know, at the state level, you have a lot of state parties that have been completely hijacked by lunatics and the people who actually know something about winning elections are fighting them and trying to get it back. You have all these, you have down ballot candidates who are not getting enough funds because Trump has sucked up all those small donor. I mean, there's so many things going wrong. Um, This doesn't help. Yeah. Okay, last, New York election interference. So there's the New York criminal case. Uh, I call it well. the Stormy Daniels case. <laughs> the, the, the Stormy Daniels case. The, the trial is set to start March 25th with jury selection. So how long do we think that trial is going to go? You know, I've heard varying estimates of, of um, I think I've heard something like possibly six weeks. I honestly don't, I, I, I kind of think that's, unnecessarily long but i think the theory the theory is that the trump lawyers will make the trial longer rather than shorter because they are going to want to do things like cross-examine michael cohen for a week and you know i don't know that that's going to help them because this is a this is fundamentally a documents case and that's part of what may take a while um at trial, this could be a relatively boring trial, except for the day that uh, this is, uh, that Stormy Daniel shows up, because it's a documents case, and basically you're going through the documents that were used to make these payoffs and that were falsified, and and I think and to get those in is going to require some testimony about how the record keeping about the, the documents and what documents are supposed to, what, what records are supposed to look like and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, that can be pretty boring stuff and it can take a while, but I don't think it can take that long, six weeks. I, 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 I think that, you know, if this were before a, a, um, like a judge Kaplan, the, the judge in the, in the Southern district who had, who tried the um, E. Jean Carroll cases, I think he'd get this done in two or three weeks and he'd force the parties to do it that way. But I, I don't know. I mean, a state court is a little, is a little different in that regard. It, its trials tend to, to, to go on a little longer, even though the judges are incredibly overworked, more so than I think federal judges are. Wait, I have a question. Why do they want this trial to go on longer? Like, what's the, what do they think they get out of questioning Michael Cohen an extra well, long time. Do they think he's just bad, and that makes that's like look, good for gonna, Trump? Like why? Uh, I, well, look. I mean, I think that they want to bloody Michael up. Okay. Um, and there's a lot to you know. There's a lot to cross-examine him on. He pled guilty to various things in federal court, um, although one of them was this very action of this uh, a federal federal campaign violation relating to this same sequence of events. And, you know, he's he, he said a lot of things that have gotten him in trouble and that were, you know, contradicted later. And he's going to have to own up to that. Um, he apparently did a decent job, I think, at the at the fraud trial. Um, but they're going to want to bloody him up again. And and I, if if only to create a distraction from the documents, like you're going to say, you, you can't believe this man, this man, but they don't have a, but they don't have a countervailing theory of the case. I think that's consistent with the documents. I mean, the notion that Michael Cohen would write out of his own pocket, a $130,000 check, if he weren't going to be reimbursed and didn't have an understanding that he was going to be reimbursed, by by Trump or the Trump organization is absurd. And when you combine that with the fact that there's no question he was reimbursed for services, you know, for legal services that didn't occur in amounts consistent with the $130,000 paid to Stormy Daniels, 
I don't know how you don't get, I don't know how you, those facts would not be established beyond a reasonable doubt. So. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yes, Last ma'am. one. In another New York civil case, the business fraud case with the $363 million verdict, Trump is like- You're forgetting the interest, appealing. interest, interest. And the interest rate, so it's half a million with interest. There's like 450 with interest. Right. Uh, yeah. And so I think Trump's currently appealing. And in the Georgia Rico case, we're waiting on the judge to decide if Fonnie Willis is disqualified. So there's, yes. you know, there's like a couple- there's a couple of things we're waiting on. What, what do you, what do you, what do you think? What do you know about those? What are, what, what's happening? What's going to happen soon? Well, every day, eight percent per annum interest. Um, oh, excuse me, nine percent. Sorry, uh, accumulates. Oh, it's accruing. On, the interest continues to accrue. Yes, it's simple interest. It's nine percent every day. Um, nine percent divided by three sixty-five or three sixty-six this year. I guess I don't know how that works actually in the leap year. Um, every day, it, it's it's the judgment. The amount is increasing every day, which is why he has to bond an amount higher than the actual currently accrued amount. Um, both in the E. Jean Carroll case, which also applies the New York State nine percent rule, and in uh, the the state fraud case, um, and so. No, he's got to come up, and we just talked about the problem that he has coming up with a bond in the Eugene Carroll case. Well, you know, he's got to come up with a bond about five times bigger in the, uh, in, in the state uh, fraud case. And I, I don't know whether he's going to be able to do that. He can still appeal. I think one of the misconceptions that you hear sometimes is like, oh, he needs to post the bond in order to appeal. Well, that's not true. He needs to post the bond in order that the appeal sus- suspend and block efforts to collect these judgments. That's 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 the way to put it. Um, I, again, I don't I don't know that he's going to come up with that, and I don't know that he's going to have a basis for reversing the judgment. As for uh, Fonnie Willis, I, I just you know I mean uh, you've heard my opinion on that. I hate everybody down there. Um, I, I think she's not going to be disqualified. Um, and, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's bloodied her up considerably. So that 9%, it accrues while he's appealing. Yes. Is that right? So at the end, Every if day. he still has to do it, if he's like, they're like, yeah, you appealed, you lost. The sum is going to be that much bigger. Correct. If he takes okay. two years, he's, you know, it doesn't, the interest accrues no matter what. When... I mean, I mean, if he loses, obviously, if he wins, then he doesn't have to pay anything. Right. Um, but he's n- not going to have a total win. But yeah, nine percent from the from the from from the date of the judgment continues. Oh well, that cheers me up. That's a nice little nugget. Well, uh, you didn't see? Did you see Tish James's tweets? Like, you know, plus one hundred and ten thousand dollars. She was doing that like for a couple of days, and that that was I basically nine percent. If he did the math, it was nine percent divided by three sixty five. Okay. Uh, I said I said that was the last one we were going to update on, but actually I was wrong because there's still the documents case. Uh, so they've they've got the the federal prosecution in Florida. What's the latest on that one? The real issue is that the timing of the trial date. Um, obviously, the Trump people want this thing kicked over to 2025. They originally asked, I think, for 2026 or something like that. And um, you know, Jack Smith wants it to occur sooner rather than later. The, and then what the, what, the, what the Trump people did, I think we might have mentioned this in a prior podcast, is they, they suggested something like August, and nobody thinks they actually meant that, the Trump people, that the, what they were trying to do is like set a temporary trial date that they would then try to move later, but they, they want to use, the, they, they, they might be trying to use the Florida trial date to block it, to, to prevent Judge Chutkin from setting down the January 6th case for trial after Labor Day, which would be a likely scenario if the Supreme Court takes all the way to the end of June to decide the immunity issue before it. Man, it is a lot to juggle. But thanks but, so but, much for but breaking but it all be- down for us. Yeah, no, it's a lot to juggle, but you, we should be grateful, you and I and our listeners, that we are not the ones facing 91 felony counts. Yes. We don't have to that juggle. That is true. Uh, 
Hey, uh, just as we close here, do you got any uh, burning hot takes on State of the Union preview? You think got anything anything Biden ought to do? Just be normal. I said that on TV this morning. We were on competing networks this morning, you and I. And I just said, look, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I, I, the, all the Democrats saying we need to get out and 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 show the, the president's accomplishments. And that's fine. That's all well and good. But the most important thing that he could do is just be normal and then say, what's his problem? That's how I think this election is going to is going to fly. I totally. So I, I was saying the same thing. Uh, we were, must have been saying the same thing. Great minds on different networks at the same ungodly early hour we're like the, it's uh, like the vulcan the vulcan mind meld right you know, <laughs> for star trek fans uh but you know part of i i do wonder if republicans haven't done joe biden a little bit of a service by setting the bar at dementia you know the guy's got dementia oh, they've done, so if, if joe they've biden done can just tr- clear the dementia line he, right he'll be okay right he'll be normal and people will be like okay he seems fine he yeah, doesn't seem fine, like he's got oatmeal right. for brains yeah and he's going to give a perfectly fine speech. He's good at that. And he, he's, you know, and even when he is not reading from a teleprompter, Joe Biden speaks in complete sentences that have articles, subjects, verbs, adverbs, objects, you know, just like the way they teach English to people who learn English, like for five-year-olds or people coming over to to the United States from foreign countries or to, you know, they, he speaks English, unlike what the other guy speaks, which is mostly gibberish. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I am grateful I don't have to listen to Donald Trump give a State of the Union. I'm often grateful that Donald Trump is not as nervous as I am about him becoming president. He is not the president right now. I do think it's a high stakes speech for Joe Biden. And I think speeches are almost to never high stakes. I almost never think a State of the Union or a speech is high stakes. But no, he I, does, I agree with you. he's got to kick off his campaign here. Yeah. Uh, show people he can do the job for another four years. Um, all right, George, thanks, as always, for explaining the legal news to me, because there is a lot of it. And thanks to everyone for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Leave us a review on your podcast app. Email us at askgeorge at the We're reading them all, and we will see you next week.